Good morning, everybody. I'd like to welcome you all to our wildfire weather webinar. Uh, my name is Philip Truitt. I'm with the Texas A&M Forest Service, and I'm a communication specialist. So first off is uh, the agenda today is introductions of who's speaking today, a little bit of the wildfire weather outlook, uh, some information on uh, the fire fuels, some tips for viewers and to give the public on wildfire prevention, and then how to work with the Texas A&M Forest Service. So we have three main speakers today. Uh, the first coming up after me is Juan Acuna. He is our fire weather analyst and meteorologist. He's a wealth of knowledge for fire weather for us in the Forest Service. After him is Tom Spencer. He's our predictive services department head, and he's also a wealth of knowledge when it comes to our, our fire outlook and uh, fire fuels. And finally closing us out is Stuart Coombs. He's a wildland urban interface specialist out of our Conroe office. And he's uh, fought fire all over the country and is a great uh, source of information about fire prevention and mitigation. So first off, who we are, the Texas A&M Forest Service. We're, we're the state's lead wildland firefighting agency, and that's through the state legislature is who founded us. We're a part of the Texas A&M University system. That's where we got our name, the Texas A&M Forest Service. A real quick thing on who's talking today and what departments, uh, particular service department, what do they do for us? They uh, study weather patterns, drought cycles, they monitor and study our wildfire occurrences and the status of vegetation statewide. So they're always out there looking and uh, getting information on what kind of fuels we have built up for wildfires. One of the things they do is they develop seasonal forecasts and daily forecasts uh, to help us prevent and respond to wildfires. Uh, some of that stuff is the, the fire danger signs you see and the fire danger maps we put out along with our injury release component maps we put out. Also, some of the stuff we do in particular services, they maintain online resources in partnership with Texas and University AgriLife. And these, this information is all available online. We're going to give you some of those links in this presentation later where to go to find that information on your own. And we also use remote autom automated weather stations across the state, or otherwise called RAW stations. And those are scattered throughout the state, and they give us an invaluable source of data to come up with a lot of the uh, information we are able to give out. So on this, I'm going to turn you all over to Juan Acuna and let him speak for a few minutes to you. All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Um, I'm going to look at the uh, fire weather outlook. Uh, for the rest of summer, going into uh, the fall and into winter as well. So we'll get right to it. We're going to start you off with the 2016 summer weather outlook summary. And a lot of what we do in fire weather uh, is based on ENSO, which is the El Nino Southern Oscillation. And uh, right now we are in a La Nina watch, uh, but currently, presently today, uh, we do have ENSO neutral conditions that are present, so there's not a uh, La Nina present, there's not an El Nino that's present. We're right in between, and uh, that's what ENSO neutral uh, conditions mean. Um, so for that, uh, that's near or below average equatorial sea surface temperatures anomalies across uh, the Pacific Ocean, and those are uh, continuing to be um, near or below average at this point. Um, as we head forward, though, La Nina is favored to develop during August, September, and October for 2016. So that's as we end the summer and head into fall. And with about a 55 to 60 percent chance of La Nina conditions during the fall and winter of 2016 and going into early next year as well. Uh, so what that means for us here in Texas, unfortunately, um, I understand a lot of you that are on, on the call with us are meteorologists, but for those that aren't, uh, you know, bear with me with the uh, sort of uh, bad news that I have for you. That usually means for us, climatologically speaking, uh, above normal temperatures uh, with an equal chance of above or below normal precipitation for, for much of the state of Texas. Um, however, deep south Texas is favored for slightly above normal precipitation, and that's just due to abundant Gulf moisture at this time. Uh, so this is what it means. This is uh, two graphics. These are uh, from the Climate Prediction Center or from NOAA, 
And the first graph that you see there is temperatures. And you can see the entire continental, basically, United States is looking at a above normal chance of warmer temperatures throughout the uh, August, September, and October time frame. And you'll see later on as we head into the uh, fall and winter, you're going to see much of that uh, continuing on. Uh, precipitation forecast going into uh, August, September, and October. Most of the state, a good 90% of the state, is an equal chance. So that's not to say that we're going to be drier than normal. That's not to say we're going to be wetter than normal. Uh, that deep south Texas area from about uh, just south of the Houston area, right around Galveston all the way down to Corpus Christi, Brownsville, you folks into the uh, deep uh, Rio Grande Valley region, um, have about a 33 or 40% chance of seeing above normal precipitation. And that's just because the weather pattern that we're in, um, the Gulf of Mexico is essentially open for business at this point. So we're counting on sea breeze effect. We're counting on uh, heat-driven uh, showers and thunderstorms that kind of persist along the coastline. And once we lose the daytime heating of the day, most of that activity dies down. So they make it to about central Texas, and then that's about it. Uh, so that's a good indication of why the uh, Climate Prediction Center has put south Texas in that above normal uh, precipitation rate. So the rest of the summer, looking dry for most and warmer than normal. As we look at the three to four week outlook, this is from today. So we're looking at about August 6th to about August 19th. And um, this is an experimental outlook for, produced by NOAA and the Climate Prediction Center and uh, was made July 22nd. Uh, but still, most of the state, in fact, all of the state, is encompassed with at least a 50% chance or greater of above normal temperatures expected with an equal chance of below or above average precipitation possible. Now, northeast Texas in a little spot right there uh, of below normal temperatures, or below normal rain chances, I should say, drier conditions more favored uh, for that area. So right now we have high pressure that kind of dominated uh, the last couple of weeks over the state, and then that high pressure moved over to the southwestern half of the United States. So we got some rainfall across the area. In fact, we, have, we still have some rainfall in the panhandle uh, this morning. Uh, but that high pressure ridge, that, that dome of dryness and heat, is expected to build back over the next couple of days and essentially almost rule the forecast for the next couple of weeks. And so that's why this three to four week outlook is looking at warmer temperatures and at least drier conditions for the northeastern half of the state. But I think a good chunk of the state of Texas has a, a chance of seeing below normal precipitation as well. And that's going to be the theme you'll find going into the remainder of my talk. Uh, as I mentioned, and so uh, we look at the climatology of the El Nino Southern Oscillation. And uh, the reason why we do this is because it, it's a good indicator of what we can expect to going into the, the seasonal forecast. And what you're seeing right here is uh, from the IRI and the CPC, so this is from the International Research Institute for Climatolo Climatology and Society and also in correlation with the Climate Prediction Center as well. And you can see most of this graph, all those graphs are trending uh, below that zero degree, uh, degree Celsius temperature anomaly. And what that indicates is the La Nina will be present. Now, if these graphs were all trending upward, uh, that would indicate an El Nino. And uh, if you joined us last year, a lot of what you saw last year was uh, trending upward. Uh, so what we see here, what is showing on the bottom of that graph are the months. So you have uh, June, June, July, August, uh, July, August, September, and so on. And so as we head towards the October, November, December time frame, uh, most of that is within that one to zero degree range. And, uh, what that's saying is we're looking at a weak El Nino that will be present. Earlier in the year, as we started 2016, there was a strong indication that there was going to be a very strong La Nina in effect. And uh, some of these graphs were tending, trending down towards the 2 to 2.5, but that's just not the case anymore. Recently, a lot of these trends are going closer to almost a weak La Nina to a neutral phase at this point. But uh, as I mentioned before, there's still a good 55 to 60 percent chance that we'll be in a weak La Nina going into early fall and into late winter as well. And this is what this is showing as well. These are the model info predictions. So these are forecast models that are predicting what the sea surface temperature anomalies will be doing out in the Pacific. And most of them are trending below that zero degree uh, Celsius uh, sea surface temperature anomaly. So again, uh, showing that most of the models are in agreement that we'll be in a weak winning uh, What we're looking at here, this is another product of IRI and CPC. Uh, this is a probabilistic and so forecast. So we're looking at probabilities now. 
Uh, on the side, you're looking at 0 to 100 percent probability, and on the bottom portion, on the horizontal run, uh, we're looking at the time period. So again, July, August, September, uh, August, September, October, and so on. And once again, as we head to the November, December, January time frame, we are favored at that 50 to between 50 and 60 uh, percent probability that we'll be in that weak La Nina. This is not saying it's going to be a strong or weak uh, La Nina. This is just the probability of which phase that we'll be in, whether it be El Nino, which is the red bar graph. And as you can see, all those are on the very, very bottom low scale, below a 10 percent chance. Uh, but one thing that has changed over the past couple of weeks is that neutral phase. As we head back into January, February, March, February, March, April, at the end of that graph there, uh, the neutral begins to increase. And that's one of the recent changes that we've seen over the past couple of weeks. So instead of indicating uh, from what we saw earlier this year of a strong La Nina and La Nina sticking around for most of 2017, um, neutral is beginning to uh, come back in that probabilistic of at least a greater than 50% chance that in so neutral uh, will return by the uh, uh, May, April, or I should say February, March, April uh, time frame going there, and, and La Nina begins to come back down. Now the climato climatological probability, you can see that El Nino and La Nina start to trend downwards, and then uh, those are the lines that I'm talking about, and that green, that neutral uh, probability begins to shoot up uh, tremendously going at, at the end of this time frame here. So with ENSO in mind and what we have going on currently, uh, this is another product. This is the three-month outlook temperature probability and the precipitation probability for October, November, December. So this is our fall forecast. And again, as I mentioned, uh, warmer and drier is going to be the theme of, of my talk here. And with the exception of a very, very small portion of North Dakota and portions of Montana, once again, almost the entire United States is encompassed with that uh, at least a 40 to 60 percent chance probability that we're going to look at warmer than normal temperatures. And of course, here in Texas, the panhandle parts of West Texas down near the Permian Basin, near the Trans-Pecos, has greater than or at least a 60 percent chance probability that we'll look at warmer temperatures. And moving on over to precipitation, at least a good 40 percent of the majority of the state is looking at drier conditions as well. Now, once again, if you joined us last year, we had El Nino coming into effect. We had uh, lots of blues over on the temperature side, indicating cooler than normal temperatures. And on the precipitation side, we saw lots of green. But now that we're turning in neutral and into La Nina, we're seeing lots of uh, drier colors and lots of warmer colors. So the fall forecast is not looking great if you're wanting the uh, cooler than normal temperatures. We're looking at warmer uh, being the trend. And we're also looking at drier for a good 95% of the state going into the October, November, December time frame. And not a whole lot changes, unfortunately, as we head into winter. Again, as I mentioned, we're looking at at least a week La Nina present, a 55 to 60 percent chance that La Nina will be present. So warmer than normal temperatures for the western half, the central and western half of the state, and a good chunk of the state at 40 percent or higher that we'll look at drier conditions, um, unfortunately, as we head to December, January, and February as well. If you notice up to the north, at least the uh, North central half of the United States looks at cooler temperatures and wetter temperatures. Is that uh, sorry about that, folks. We just took a little bit of a power hit here. So uh, looks like we'll continue going. I think we're still online here. So I'll continue on. Um, once again, we, we looked at cooler than normal temperatures and wetter than normal temperatures for the northern tier of the United States. And that's just because when La Nina is present, our, our uh, polar, uh, sub, our tropical jet, I should say, uh, trends farther to the north. So a lot of the low pressure systems that brought us the cooler than normal temperatures and a lot of the rainfall than what we saw last year is now going to be moving to the northern half of the United States. So that's why they're looking at cooler temperatures, and that's why they're looking at wetter temperatures. And so that track of that, that jet stream is now farther north versus farther south. Uh, so that's why we're looking at warmer and drier for us here. Uh, so to summarize uh, the fall winter weather outlook, uh, we have La Nina influenced weather uh, for Texas. That's going to be the common theme. Uh, so that's below normal precipitation. That's above normal temperatures. Now with that in mind, again, as I just mentioned, that polar jet stream that's very variable during La Nina 
is now farther to the north. So we're looking at uh, cold fronts coming into the area now with lots of wind and not necessarily lots of rainfall, unfortunately. So that's kind of a bad uh, combination when it comes to fire weather because these fronts are going to come in dry. Uh, they could come in fast with lots of wind and dry air. And that's not a really good combination, especially since we're drying out already with the fuels already drying out as we head into fall and winter. So more wind and dry frontal intrusion. Uh, we could see wind gusts going 30, 40, and even higher, 50 miles per hour with some of these fronts that are expected to come in as we head into the winter months. And what that means is an increased probability of high impact fire weather. Um, and we'll also need to keep our resources uh, particularly updated when these fronts get start to get close, getting closer to the state of Texas because we'll see dramatic wind shifts as well. We could have a southeasterly wind ahead of these fronts, or a southwesterly wind, I should say, uh, that'll be pretty brisk. And then once the frontal intrusion comes in, you know, we'll have a strong north-northeasterly flow. And uh, especially if there's already fires present, um, that could create a very active uh, uh, fire behavior um, once they start going. Uh, and with that, I'm going to hand it over to Tom Spencer, the head of the Predictive Services Department. Morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, so, want to get over into the uh, fuels and the uh, fire season potential now. Uh, first, what do we look at um, when thinking about or looking at the potential for a uh, fire season, whether it's summer fire season or fall or winter fire season? One of the first things we look at is the amount of fuel on the ground that's uh, available to burn. And so it's, it turns out that uh, May and June are play key roles in that, and particularly the amount of precipitation that we get in May and June, because it sort of sets the table for the rest of the summer uh, going into the fall as far as uh, how much grass is on the ground. As you can see, the uh, image on the right there is a uh, two-month uh, uh, sort of a it's not really, it's sort of a percent of normal precipitation map. It's uh, SPI, significant precipitation index. And all of the greens and blues represent above normal precipitation. Uh, the uh, white or the clear would be normal. And uh, even though with normal precipitation, uh, May and June is our two highest precipitation months, so that's still quite a bit of precipitation across the state. If you look, the map on the image on the left uh, is uh, what happened last year. And if you remember, you know, it was a very wet May and June last year as well across the state. Uh, some of the areas, though, this year that are of concern to us is all the rains we got into the hill country, north central Texas, east Texas, down into south Texas. And so that's growing a lot of grass. So I'm going to kind of take you around the state and show you uh, some of the areas in the state uh, where we typically have uh, fire concerns and we'll look at the fuels. First uh, image on the left is in Gillespie County there in the central hill country uh, on the LBJ uh, ranch. Uh, on the right is up in north central Texas, north of the Metroplex, up in Wise County. Pretty good fuel loadings in both of those both of those areas uh, after the rains of May and June. Uh, moving down into central Texas, looking at Hayes County in between uh, San Antonio and Austin, see pretty good loading there in amongst the cedars, the junipers. And over on the right, the image on the right is down in south Texas. Uh, in McMullen County, um, we used to think that uh, South Texas didn't really have much of a fire season or fire activity until we started realizing that, well, when you get a lot of grass like this, they do. So that, uh, real, that becomes a uh, concern for us down in South Texas when we, when we see this much grass down there. Uh, and then moving up into uh, East Tech, over to East Texas, up into Northeast Texas, up into Morris County. Over in Harrison County, uh, good grass loadings there as well. And one of the concerns for us when you get grass loadings like this in uh, East Texas is that these, these, this type of uh, fuel becomes a carrier uh, into the more problematic fuels like the timber fuels you see in the background. Uh, fires can get started in the grasses and carry over into the timber fuels. And then this is Briscoe County up in the uh, Panhandle region just south of Amarillo. Uh, the image on the left is uh, the plains showing the grass, uh, fairly good standard grass out across the plains in Briscoe County. And then Briscoe County also has the canyonlands. 
there, and you can see that uh, that grass uh, is a is a good carrier in down into the canyon lands. And once fire gets down into those areas, it becomes very difficult to control, uh, very hard to put out. So, real concern for us there as well. Uh, this is a in a couple of shots from a fire we had back on July 11th. It was the Wilds Canyon fire in Stevens County. Uh, what you can see there in the foreground on the left is the abundance of grasses that we had uh, that we have there, and uh, you can see that the fire, the black, the black scarring of the fire, you can see it even the smoke in the background. We had some wind that day, and uh, that wind just pushed that fire right through there. Even though we had still had some green in the grasses, it's just the uh, the amount of fuel and the amount of heat that's generated from that fuel just overpowers the green. And, and carry that fire, and it actually carried it back into some timber fuels in the background that you can see on the right there, and uh, had some control problems on this fire back in uh, the second week of July. So uh, where are we now? This is the 30-day percent of uh, normal moisture, uh, looking at across the state as of yesterday, and you can see that uh, unlike the image that I showed you earlier with a lot of the blues and greens and everything across the state, this has a lot of reds, yellows on it uh, in some of the areas that have been dry. And it turns out that uh, it's very similar to what we saw last year where we you know, got the good rains in May and June and then we went through a long dry stretch. Uh, same thing this year, you know, about the second, third week of June, you know, the moisture just began to cut off. And we've gone through most of that period and almost all this month except for this last week of July dry across the state. And so we've seen significant drying uh, with the high temperatures uh, each day uh, drying out, and you can see that. In the areas uh, particularly uh, of concern to us are the, uh, the hill country, uh, down into South Texas, up into the area in between the Metroplex, Abilene, up to the PK area, uh, even portions of the Panhandle, uh, up into the Bristol County area that we mentioned. And over into East Texas, up in the Northeast Texas, even into Central Texas, uh, you can see areas where we have some concerns for drying. And uh, we're just now entering August. Uh, still got a good way to go to get through the, the heat of the summer. So uh, being this dry at this point is a concern for us. And you also notice the uh, sort of the, the spottiness of the rainfall on this map. It's very typical of the summer rainfall pattern. Uh, you get some areas that will benefit from these scattered showers. And then right next door, their neighbor, the neighboring county or neighboring area could, will still be very dry and uh, have, a, have a high potential for wildfire. So you know, this is our concern uh, heading into the, you know, the midpoint, the latter part of summer, is that some of these areas where we tend to have problematic summer fires are very dry at this point. Uh, this is a, a graph showing uh, the uh, our current fire occurrence levels. The red line represents this year, 2016, and the number of fire responses that we've had so far. July, August, and September are the typical summer fire season. And that green line represents the average number of fires for the last 10 years. Uh, red line this year. The dotted blue line represents last year. Kind of started off a little slow last year, but picked up and became above normal by the time we got to about the middle of August last year. Uh, so far this year, we're right about normal, but uh, with the dryness out there and still a lot of the summer left, uh, our concern is that we'll probably go above normal uh, before we exit August uh, uh, this year as well. So definitely a concern there. So outlook summary for uh, for summer uh, this year. So our weather concerns, as uh, mentioned by one, is that the one is that we have above normal temperatures forecast, uncertain moisture. But uh, you know, given the nature of moisture in the summer, it's generally spotty. Uh, so we're going to continue to see some areas remain dry and they continue to increase in, in uh, wildfire potential. Our fuel concerns are, of course, the abundant grass fuel loading that's across the landscape and those areas that are beginning, and, and of course, the critical levels of dryness as uh, those high temperatures, which are expected to return to the state next week. Uh, high upper, upper 90s, close to 100 degrees, that really, it really works on those fuels and drying them out. And uh, so we had, that's our concern going into the summer is that we're already dry in some places and that uh, we can get drier 
So the most likely outcome is that in these dry areas we can see, uh, you know, an active fire season with some potential for large fires. Uh, you know, if we do uh, see the a little, a little more moisture coming to the state, uh, even if it's scattered, that might keep us more at normal levels. And of course, uh, the next case below that would be if we would somehow get some tropical moisture into the state, uh, uh, which is uh, probably on the low end considering uh, the lack of uh, tropical activity that we've been seeing so far this year. So, but our most likely outcome and our concern for the summer is that uh, in these dry areas that we'll continue to see them dry and uh, the activity will continue to increase. Uh, just to uh, give you an idea of what summer fires look like and how dangerous they can burn, how dangerous they can be, uh, they burn very hot. Uh, they just don't burn on the surface. They also can burn up into the crowns, or what we call the aerial fuels. Um, these are a couple of pictures show just how hot, and uh, you can just almost feel the heat off of those fires from here just by looking at them and how dangerous these fires are. Very, very dangerous fires that we have in the summer because of how hot and how difficult uh, these fires are to control. Uh, looking at the weather concerns then, setting the stage uh, for the fall and winter. Of course, the, uh, as Juan mentioned, the influence of La Nina with the below normal precip, above normal temperatures expect, expected. And then you add to that the, uh, the dry frontal intrusions or the, the winds. Typically, you don't get a lot of wind in the summer. It's under high pressure that makes for fuels. When those fronts start coming back into the state, we get winds on top of those dry fuels, then we can that even amps up uh, the concern even more for the potential for large fires. Of course, our fuel concerns are the abundant grass loading across the state, uh, critical dryness, critical fuel dryness. Uh, this uh, summer fire season extends into the fall. Uh, we had we experienced that last year, and uh, we saw some uh, critical fires last fall because of that. The concern is that we can see that this year as well. So our fire season potential looking uh, ahead to the fall and winter is that with La Nina, uh, we anticipate a, an active uh, winter, fall and winter fire season. We've had some of our most active winter fire seasons when La Nina is present, 2011 uh, being the most recent. Uh, when this uh, event, when La Nina is in place there, it just uh, favors uh, increased fire activity, and of course, when you add to that all the fuel that we have on the ground, uh, just amps up the uh, concern that we have headed into the fall and winter of this year. Of course, if La Nina for some reason doesn't develop and uh, you know we stay neutral through the period, that could uh, work in our favor. Uh, you can kind of keep your fingers crossed there, uh, but uh, you know that would uh, probably amp it down a little bit, amp it down a little bit as far as our expectations. But right now, with the forecast for La Nina, our anticipations are for an active winter, fall and winter fire season. And I'll leave it there. I want, I've got one more slide just to show you what the, our concerns are for winter fires when we get uh, heavy fuels uh, and winds. Uh, these, these are fast-moving fires. Uh, they burn hot, they're hard to control, and they threaten anything that are out in front of uh, very dangerous fire situations. Turn it over to Stuart. All right, thank you, Tom. Uh, thank you all once again for joining us. Uh, my name is Stuart Coombs, and I'm a wildland urban interface specialist with the Texas a and Forest Service. I'm based out of the W.G. G. Jones State Forest in Conroe, and this is my 15th season as a wildland firefighter. Uh, my duties include participating in a variety of wildfire mitigation and prevention programs, uh, but today, I'd like to share a few tips on how to prepare for wildfire, wildfire prevention, and safety this summer fire season. Uh, following these tips and concepts are proven and effective ways to reduce home loss in the event of a wildfire. Uh, being firewise is a proactive approach to wildfire prevention by properly assessing risks to a home or property and implementing preventative measures. Uh, the idea is for a home to be able to stand alone or survive if a wildfire passes through the area. Uh, this can be done by creating a firewise landscape or managing vegetation, uh, or as we fire firefighters call it, fuel, 
near the home to keep the fire close to the ground and of low intensity. Basically, if you can visualize the arrangement and continuity of the vegetation as being overgrown, dense, uh, volatilely arranged on one end of the spectrum to short, green grass on the other. Uh, for the meteorologists uh, attending today, you know, if we can encourage uh, viewers and the general public to be proactive and merely Google FireWise, or search firewise.org, they will be connected to resources that will help them reduce home loss in the event of a wildfire. Uh, firewise construction or using building materials less susceptible to wildfire impacts is another way to prepare and mitigate against wildfire. Uh, we use the terms home ignition zone and defensible space as ways to define, define these concepts around a structure. Uh, the graphic illustrates how firewise landscaping techniques are implemented. You know, stacking firewood away from the home, uh, removing brush, limbing trees are just some simple ways that homeowners can limit fire spread uh, if a wildfire uh, was to occur. So sharing those terms of home ignition zone and defensible space are, uh, are good ways to get the, the public to envision these uh, firewise concepts and, uh, and learn the principles. Uh, you know, during a wildfire, uh, homes can be lost through direct, direct flame impingement or direct flames or a wall of flames overtaking the structure. However, uh, most of the time, homes are lost due to ember intrusion or embers traveling from a burning tree or other fuel source and then traveling uh, up to several miles away, uh, landing in a receptive fuel bed on or near the structure itself. Uh, being embers aware, is identifying those wood piles, dirty gutters, leaves, open eaves, and even lawn furniture, uh, basically anywhere an ember could land and cause further spread. Eliminating these ember receptors are as easy as cleaning the gutters, screening the attic, uh, softening the vents, and uh, skirting eaves and foundations. Uh, the past three slides uh, show covers of three excellent publications we offer at our web at our Texas A&M Forest Service website, along with a variety of other information on how to be firewise and prepare for wildfire. Uh, this information and publications can be found at the link on the bottom of your screen. Uh, another program we are involved in is called Ready Set Go. Uh, the Ready Set Go program provides resources to help prepare for wildfire and other types of emergency evacuations. As firefighters, we want to get in there and start the fighting the fire and not have to dedicate time and resources to evacuation procedures. Uh, the goal of Ready, Set, Go is to promote safety uh, by following these three basic tenets. Um, it's, you know, it's being ready around the home with the uh, firewise concepts we've discussed but also assembling emergency supplies and important belongings in a way they are easily accessible or in a safe place. Uh, planning escape routes beforehand and ensuring the re those residing in, inside the home know the plan of action if needed. Uh, being set uh, by staying aware of the latest news and information from local media and fire departments and uh, go, going early. Follow your personal wildland fire action plan uh, doing so will not only support your own safety, but will allow firefighters to easily maneuver resources to best combat the fire. Don't hesitate, act early, and act decisively. And, you know, um, for the meteorologists on, you know, emphasizing with your viewers that the quicker the folks are out, the quicker and more safely we can engage the fire. Uh, we use the media all the time as a crucial way to relay this important information about wildfire evacuations. and. Uh, also, as uh, media and fire professionals, uh, the Ready, Set, Go program has numerous publications, slideshows, uh, videos, resources, and um, a lot of interesting stuff if you're interested in utilizing uh, in your broadcast. Uh, nine out of ten wildfires in Texas are human-caused, with 90% of those ignitions starting from debris burning. Uh, or burning waste in a pile or burn barrel and then unintentionally igniting adjacent fuels. Uh, I really like to emphasize that statistic, uh, you know, 9 out of 10 human caused, 90% of those being from debris burning, it, it, it really seems to resonate. So 
some tips for safe debris burning uh, to share are always comply with your local regulations. Uh, contact your local fire department in advance to confirm that burning is allowed and to find out whether a permit is required to burn debris. Uh, check your weather forecast. Uh, ensure there's not going to be any sudden gusts of wind, uh, weather fluctuations. Uh, choose a safe burning site. A safe site will be far away from power lines, overhanging limbs, buildings, automobiles, and equipment. Uh, prepare the site correctly. The ground around the burn site should be surrounded by gravel or mineral soil, uh, dirt, for at least 10 feet in all directions. Uh, keeping the surrounding area watered down uh, also helps uh, when doing a debris burn. Um, if using a burn barrel, uh, make sure it's equipped with the proper features. Uh, always stay with your fire uh, until it's completely out. Uh, can't emphasize that enough. Uh, ensure that it's been completely extinguished. Drown the fire with water. Turn over the ashes with the shovel and drown it again. Uh, repeat several times. Uh, check the burn area regularly over the next several days uh, just to make sure that it's uh, completely out uh, and doesn't rekindle. And then keep it legal. Um, it's illegal to burn plastic tires and most other waste products that are not from uh, trees or shrubs. So following these precautions uh, will help uh, prevent unwanted wildfires uh, for debris burning. Uh, one of my personally favorite tools to use each day is the uh, Texas Interagency Coordination Center's Predictive Services website. Uh, numerous geographically specific fire-related products are produced and updated daily. Uh, this consolidation of information is easily accessible and readable. Uh, you may get to the site by navigating to the TIC or Texas Interagency Coordination Center homepage at the link listed. Uh, selecting the Predictive Services tab, and then enjoy the wide selection of products and information pertaining to fire weather and fuel conditions. Uh, you know, for the meteorologists attending, this to me is probably the best place for uh, fire-specific weather uh, to incorporate into your broadcast. Uh, not only the content, uh, but the products as well. Uh, some of the examples of the predictive service products, uh, these products can provide import, important fire weather and fuels forecast at a moment's notice and help determine the severity of fire weather conditions uh, in your localized area. Some examples of products are shown, such as the current fuel dryness, uh, observed fire danger, and critical thresholds. Uh, many more are available, and I encourage you all to uh, visit this website, uh, especially as uh, these drying trends continue. Um, another cool product uh, that's produced daily is our daily burn uh, van map. Uh, the map is easily accessed by visiting the Texas A&M Forest Services homepage at the link at the top of your slide and then clicking on the burn van symbol that uh, is shown there. Uh, county burn van orders are established by county judges and or county commissioner's courts. The Texas A&M Forest Service is not responsible for establishing or removing burn bans. The Texas A&M Forest Service uses this daily burn ban map as a reference product in a public service. Uh, the Texas Wildfire Risk Assessment Portal is a great website which allows the public and government officials to explore wildfire risk anywhere in Texas at the click of a button. Uh, simply search TexRap from your browser and begin. Uh, it's, it's, the, the, the program, it's uh, similar to navigating through Google Earth, uh, but TexRap enables the user to select public viewer, then zoom into the neighborhood scale or out to the countywide scale. Uh, one may toggle between about 20 layers that exist as geospatial data integrated and layered over a map of our state. Uh, all layers pertain to wildfire risk, the wildland urban interface, vegetation, uh, fire behavior, uh, historic fire occurrence. Uh, but anyhow, this program is a great way for anyone to get an idea of their risk from an unwanted fire. Um, you know, and as meteorologists and the fire professionals attending, you may sign up as a professional viewer and uh, be able to use the text wrap as a way to communicate the risk and uh, risk factors for your, for your area. And uh, lastly, 
Uh, we at Texas A&M Forest Service have public information officers on staff that are not only experienced in wildfire operations and terminology, but are fire line qualified and ready to assist uh, local governments with incident information needs. Uh, these PIOs can serve as liaisons to other resources such as dozers, overhead, and aircraft our agency can provide. So uh, just uh, thank you for letting me share some of those uh, fire prevention tips. Uh, we appreciate your time, and uh, I'll let Philip take back over. Yeah, I just want to thank you all for attending. Here's a few websites and ways you can follow us to keep in touch. Uh, the tech.tamu.ed website, again, it has the information on uh, uh, the fuels and fire weather, as well as other resources we're going. We also have the dispatch tracker. .tame.edu, and that shows what fires we're responding to as a state. All the fires are on there. Another website we have is this TFS web, .tamu.edu slash media resources. And this has a link to a lot of our public service announcements, uh, ways to get in contact with us, and loads more resources you can use at uh, the tip of touch of your fingers. Uh, if you want to stay in contact with us, we have two Twitter accounts. There's, text, there's at Texas Forest Service, and that's our main Twitter account. And if you want to hear about what's going on as in regards to wildfires or all hazard response, that TFS All Hazards is an account to follow. We update uh, regularly whenever we're on fire response or emergency response. You can also find us on Facebook, and the website is www.facebook.com forward slash Texas Forest Service. And you can email us at any time at newsmedia at tfs.tamu.edu. And if you have any questions about this webinar and you want to uh, learn more information, please email us at newsmedia, and we will uh, respond back to you pretty quickly. So I thank you all for attending, and hope you all have a great rest of your day.